feels like forever ago. And I remember going as a young 19-year-old. I'd done a, an internship at the church, and I felt the call of God to go to Bible college. And as I got there, there was this phrase that they used to say. They used to say, a ring before spring or your money back. All right? And what that did was that set up all of us young, single Bible college people to think, hmm, maybe I'm going to find my wife at Bible college. And so as I got there, I quickly realized that I was basically one of the only single people at the Bible college, right? All of my friends were in relationships. They've been in relationships for a long time. They're all getting engaged and married. And there I was, single old me, right? And so I tried my hand at dating. You know, I went on one or two dates, but I realized it wasn't the right time for me. Not now, later. So I spent all summer after my first year at Bible college going on a real journey with God, you know. I was praying to God. God was teaching me about being content in singleness. And it matters a lot to be content when you're single because even when you are married, even when you become one, you are still your own individual in a relationship with God. Now that must maintain, that must stay. And so God's really working on me over the summer and then I get back to Bible college and I go for a spoon's breakfast with the lads, you know. We go, we go for a little spoon's breakfast, catch up, talk about all that's happened over the summer. So I'm sat with Arnold and I'm sat with Kiva and I'm telling them, I'm like, lads, you know, God's really been doing a work in me. You know, I think, I think I just need to work on being single this year. In fact, I think I'm going to be single till I'm 25. I think I might even just not even think about relationships until I'm 25. And the lads were a little bit surprised. And they were like, really? And I was like, yeah, no, serious. I'm serious about this. I just want to work on my relationship with God. I think for me, relationships, it's not now. It's later. The very next week, I go to a conference in Manchester. I see Alexa across the room. <laughs> Alexa sees me. And I thought, okay, now. <laughs> Lo and behold, here we are, four years married. I'm very blessed. I'm very blessed. She's amazing. And uh, I've realized in life, you know, we are the people of now. We live in a generation that is all about now, the present. You know, we don't want to buy things later when we saved up for them. We buy things on Klarna so we can get it now and pay later. In fact, I was even in the, uh, the petrol garage just getting some fuel for the car. And as I go to pay, I see all the chocolate bars. You know, they just put them there to tempt you, don't they? I see all the chocolate bars. And on the side of the Snickers and the Mars packet, it says this. One now, one later. I thought, you're dreaming. If I'm buying that bad boy, I'm eating it now. That whole thing is mine. I'm not eating one half of it, putting it away, leaving it in the fridge, maybe going back to it tomorrow. I'm eating that one and a fudge on the side because I'm just... I'm all about the now. But what I've realized about God is this. He loves later. Our God loves to promise things to us, not for now, but for later. And it's difficult for us as Christians in the modern day to understand that our God is the God of now and the God of later. And it's a tension that we have to manage we have to manage the tension of being Pentecostals who believe in the fire and the power of God to move now, but also know that God might do it tomorrow instead. So I want us to look at the life of Jeremiah this morning, because I believe he was an expert at managing the tension between now and later. So if you turn with me, we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 32, and we're going to read two parts from 9 to 15, and then from 36 to 41. But before we dive into the text, I'll give you a little bit of context. What you need to know about the history of Israel at this time is it's really dire. It's really bad. Israel right now is being seized by the nation of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar is doing everything he can to conquer the Israelites. And here we find little old Jeremiah the prophet called and anointed by God. And everything that God is saying through him is this, God is going to have his wrath, his judgment, and exact his anger upon you, O oh, wicked people. It's a rough calling. Do you know what I mean? No one wants to be that guy. But Jeremiah was called to prophesy the downfall of Israel, but also the future hope that there will come a redemption in God. 
Jeremiah had to navigate the tension of what he could presently see in the here and now and what God was promising to happen later. So we're going to read. Are you ready? All right, we're going to read. I'm going to read from the ESV. Um, it's my favorite version. I encourage you to try it out. It's awesome. And it says this. And I bought the field at Anathoth from Hanamel, my cousin, and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the deed of purchase, containing the terms and conditions and the open copy. And I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, son of Isaiah, in the presence of Hanamel, my cousin, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. I charged Baruch in their presence, saying this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware vessel that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall again be brought in this land. And verse 36 says this, Now therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Concerning this city of which you say, it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place. I will make them dwell in safety. They shall be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant, that I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts, that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good. I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all of my heart and all my soul. Now, Father God, we just thank you for your word. God, we pray that we would have open hearts, open minds, and open ears. God, to your word this morning. Holy Spirit, come alongside us. Help us to understand who you are and how to live more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I admit, okay, a bit of a strange passage, right? Why are we reading about buying fields? Why are we reading about the promises of a future hope? But there's, there's two key things I want to focus on this morning. The little passage about buying a field and the passage about the future hope. And there's something I love so much about God in this story. Is that God is able to speak hope into the context of destruction. You know, if you look at the passage, it's quite clear. The Israelites are undergoing famine, pestilence and the sword. Now, I've never undergone those things, but I can understand that this is a terrible time for God's people. But what I love about God is this. He is not just able to speak over the now, but he's able to speak over the later. I want to encourage you with this. God has the final say over your situation. Our God is the Alpha and the Omega. It means this. He's the beginning and the end. And unlike us, unlike you and me who are stuck in this present moment, and some of you who are even stuck in the past by bowling, Buying, buying bowler hats for Culture Sunday. We live in the moment that we have, but God is working in all things and at all times for the good of his people. I mean, how incredible is this passage? God is saying to his people, I will rejoice in doing you good. I will make a covenant with you. I will love you with all my heart and my soul. I will put the fear of me in your hearts. How incredible is it that we have a God who says over our situations that there is hope. That there is going to be an end to the suffering and a beginning of freedom. That one day you will know me in fullness. I love this about God. That he speaks over our future good things. Turn to your neighbor say, there's a good thing coming. But as I read this passage, I feel for Jeremiah more and more. Because 
Jeremiah has to give this prophecy knowing that he himself will never see it come to pass. Jeremiah has to be obedient to the God of tomorrow with duties of today, knowing that it won't actually make a difference to the right here and the right now. Jeremiah knows that the Babylonians are going to win. And yet he's still faithfully obedient to God. I wondered this morning if you knew some of the sufferings that God had in store for you if you'd have chosen to follow him all those years ago. But actually, the life that we live in following God is about obedience in the here and the now. And I think nothing shows this more than the passage about Jeremiah buying a field. You think, why buy a field? You know, if you look at it from an investor's point of view, and some of you are businessmen and women, some of you dabble in stocks and shares. I, mean, I don't know what you do with your finances, but all of us live a life of trying to you know, make sure we have more this month than we did the last month. If I was going to encourage you to invest, the last place I would encourage you to invest is land in a nation that's about to be conquered by another nation. Because guess what happens to the land? You don't own it anymore. King Nebuchadnezzar owns the land. And yet God, asking with blind obedience and no explanation, says to Jeremiah, go and buy a field. So Jeremiah takes his 17 shekels. You know, I'm not the kind of pastor that has added up how much that is. I'm going to be honest with you, but let's just say it's a lot. A lot of money. Jeremiah spends a lot of money on a field in a pure act of obedience, knowing that to some extent his obedience is futile. Knowing that to some extent buying this field is not for now but it's for later. I want to encourage you on Community Sunday that some of the things we do today are not for now, but they're for later. And what I love about this passage is God says, there will be a time where fields and houses and vineyards will be bought again in this land. But what Jeremiah is doing is he is making a prophetic claim on the land, saying, no matter the circumstances I see now, this land belongs to God. I wonder what Dartford would look like if we as a church made a decision to go, we are going to spend our finances now making a claim that this land, this city, this town, belongs to God. That with our food bank donations and with the care that we give and the ways that we are generous, even though we can't end poverty, even though we can't fix the economics of our country, even though we can give just a small thing, we're giving it prophetically saying, God, what we give now, we entrust to you later. We know that God, by giving hope now, it will make a difference to those who need it the most. And I want to encourage you this morning to be obedient to God today. And in doing so, you are facilitating hope for tomorrow. You are facilitating hope for tomorrow. God demands our obedience in the now. Now, I wonder how you would take it if God told you to go and spend a large sum of money on something that seemed meaningless. But I think, if I'm honest, I'd probably argue with God. I'd be like, God, don't you know I'm trying to go on holiday? God, don't you know I, I've been saving up for this? And God, I want to I buy my own house. God, there are things that, that I, I want to spend this money on. God, why would I do this now when God, look at the state of the country I'm in. Look at the state of the circumstances in. How about, God, you do something now, yeah? And then I'll do something later with my finances once I know that you're going to come through and come good for me. But it doesn't work like that. God's not Klarna. It's not miracle now, pay later. It's pay now, miracle later. 
that God demands of us some level of generous obedience, not even knowing if it's going to make a difference, but trusting that the God of our tomorrow, who works all things for good, who from him was all things and to him all things, is going to do something with our little. God is actively working on your tomorrow, but he demands your obedience today. I wonder what it is this morning that God is calling you to be obedient in. God always has a habit of tugging on our hearts for one thing. And you can try and ignore it, but God will make it all the more louder. The desire, the need to obey him in something that doesn't quite make sense. You know, I, um, I really struggled to pass my driving test. It's not a secret. I don't know why I struggled so much, but I just, I just couldn't get it. I tried many times, and I couldn't get it. And eventually I did get it, right? Eventually I did get it. But for a long time, I just couldn't seem to pass my driving test. And so what I would do is this. I would get a train in to work. Anyone get the train for their commute? Yeah, any Thameslink, Thameslink people? Come on now. You know it's dangerous times out there. It's crazy. The things you see on a train, oh my day. Some Friday nights home from youth, I was like, what is this place, hell? Um, honestly, trains are crazy. And so I would get in the train every day to work. And obviously you guys know where Dartford Station is, right? So I would walk from Dartford Station, cut through the little shortcut, walk past Mackey's, go to work. Sometimes as I cut past Mackey's, get myself a little breakfast, you know? One day I'm walking to work, and there, in between McDonald's and church, is a homeless man. I'd never seen him before. You know, a lot of the homeless in Dartford, we see, we get to know, but this was a, a new homeless man. I'd, I'd never seen him before. And in that moment, I felt God prompt me to buy him some breakfast. So I'll go back into McDonald's. I order a double sausage and egg muffin meal with an extra hash brown. And then I order another one because I'm like, hey, if I'm being generous to him, I might as well be generous to myself now. And I take this McDonald's and I give it to the guy and I go, hey, God bless. Here's some food. And I go to work and I work my day and I don't think about it. The next day, I come back. I walk past McDonald's to Dartford. Guess who's sitting there? Same guy. And I was like, and I, was, I didn't have any money at this point. I, I used up my allowance on the, the generous McDonald's. I was like, oh, hey, mate, how you doing? And he's like, yeah, really good. And in that moment, you know how like British people have this tendency to go, oh, you're all right. Yeah, I'm all right. And then you just walk on. I just felt God lead me to not walk on, but to stay. So I sat down next to this guy. He began to tell me his name. He began to tell me some of his story. We were chatting for a little bit. And then I asked him the big question. I said, hey, you know, if you don't mind me asking, how did you end up on the streets? You know, what's your situation? And Peter began to tell me that he'd lost his job. He had a job for a long time, many years, and they'd made redundancies, and he'd been fired. And at the same time he'd lost his job, his partner had kicked him out of the house. He had a, a relational breakdown. And so he was staying on the streets when she was working her shift, and then sneaking home to get a shower and some food when she wasn't about. And he said, I'm desperate for a job. And uh, a bit like in Acts, you know, I knew I'm not a social worker. I don't have the power to home this man. I don't have the power to get this man a job. And I don't have loads and loads of money to keep feeding him McDonald's. But I did have something. I had the message of Jesus. So I began to sat with Peter. And we're talking. And somehow we ended up speaking about aliens and life after death and all these crazy topics. But in all the crazy topics and stories, I just began to share with Peter my story. At the age of 16, I had a real encounter with God. God changed my life. I've never looked back. And God has been by my side every day. I said, Peter, I have hope for you because of what Jesus has done for me. I know that I can't change your life, but Jesus can. And he was like, oh, thanks. You know, he thought I was crazy. I was like, mate, you believe in aliens. So 
But the next day I go and I get the J. John book, Jesus is. I give it to him. I'm like, you've got loads of time on your hands. Come on, read this so we can talk about it. And days turned into, you know, it was a few weeks, maybe two or three weeks where I would chat to him on the street. And then one day he wasn't there anymore. And I didn't see him for ages. And eventually I bumped into him at Sainsbury's and he'd found a job and he'd found a flat and he was off the streets. But here's the thing. I didn't rehome him. I didn't get him the job. But I do believe I did one significant thing. I spoke hope into a broken context. I spoke hope into a broken context. And I want to encourage us this morning to be people who don't allow hopelessness in our lives. You know, Claire Booth Luce says this, there are no hopeless situations. There are only people who have grown hopeless about them. I think what we can learn from this story in Jeremiah is this, God continually spoke hope into brokenness by being generous with what he had and by speaking life over death and destruction. We know that today we're living in the promises that God made. That one heart, one way, we're living in that. That new covenant, that's ours. We have faith and hope in Jesus. But guess what? In our present day, there is still poverty. There are still orphans and widows There are still the sick and the needy. There is still a world outside of these doors that is desperate for hope. And we have this hope in Christ that he will never fail us, nor forsake us, nor abandon us. That he makes us children of God and takes care of our every need. The world without Jesus is hopeless, but in him is hope for all things. And I want to encourage you, church, if there's anything you take away from this message, it's that you have the greatest gift for your community, and his name is Jesus. You might not have a lot to give financially, but you have everything to give in Christ. And I want to encourage you to start the conversations with Jesus. Because what people need right now is not just food, it's not just temporary things, but it is an everlasting hope. An everlasting hope. And I'm so grateful that God has called us to do it as a family. You, know, you don't have to do this on your own. But God has made a way for you to be a hope giver in a community. You know, maybe you're here right now and, you know, you're not so comfortable with talking to strangers about aliens and all of that stuff and just having a conversation on the street. But maybe go in a two or a three or as a connect group. Or maybe make an initiative at the school that your children goes to. Or at your workplace to make a difference. There are things that we can do to bring hope to the hopelessness. And the reason I know that we can hope in God is because he has never once failed. You know, we sung that song today. There is no body in the grave now. Can you imagine how hopeless the disciples must have felt? Jesus, our Messiah, our Savior, had died. We'd seen him die. He was buried in a tomb. There was no hope. But in God, all things are possible. As Christ rose from the dead, he rose victorious, declaring that not even death could hold down the hope of the world. I wonder what the context of your story is right now. Maybe you've lost hope. Maybe you feel like you're under siege, under sword, under famine. That there are things in your life right now that feel hopeless and you have been begging God for change. I can't guarantee a change this morning, but I can guarantee that you can have hope in the God of tomorrow. You can have hope in the God of tomorrow because there are days where it feels like things are dead and buried, but there are also days of resurrection and new life. 
And there is a new day coming for you, for your family. And guess what? Coming for this world. It says in Revelation that he will come on a cloud with all the glory and the host of heaven. There is a day where poverty will be no more. There is a day where sickness will be no more. There is a day where shame and sin and pain will be no more. And we hold to this hope because we serve the God of now and the God of later. I'd love to pray for you this morning. I wonder if you could bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want to make space for two groups of people. You know, maybe you're here and you can relate to Jeremiah. You feel like you're in a context that is broken, a circumstance in which you are despairing in a situation where you feel like there is no hope. I just want to pray over you this morning that God would restore your hope. He is able to give you a hope in your heart that never fades and never ceases. And so if that's you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand after the count of three, and then I'm going to pray for you. So if that's you, can you raise your hand after one, two, and three? Let's see those hands. Is there anyone else? Yeah, I see that hand. Okay, you can lower your hands. God, right now, I prophesy over these situations that, God, you are going to bring change, hope, and life. God, we know that circumstances can be tough and difficult. God, even the Apostle Paul, God, was shipwrecked on Malta. But, God, we know this. Malta didn't last forever. There came a day in which the season was over, done and finished. And God, I pray right now for the people in this room who are so desperate for a way out, so desperate, God, for you to do something, so desperate, God, for you to make a change. God, I pray right now that they would obey you, that, God, they would trust you, that, God, they would be faithful to you. God, that they would have their hope restored in this moment, joy overflowing in this moment, passion for you and zeal for your house in abundance in this moment. God, knowing that you are able to do all things and, God, you know when to do all things. God, we trust in your perfect timing. God, if it was up to us, God, we want you to do it right here, right now, today. But God, we know that you're orchestrating our tomorrow. And God, when you do things, it is far greater than when man does things. God, when you do things, it is perfect. It is, it is amazing and great and wonderful. And God, we pray that we wouldn't be people who try to rush your great works. Proud enough to, to try and hurry you along. But God, I pray in humility and obedience, we would submit to your will, your way, and your timing. In these situations, I pray. Amen. And for the second group of people, I just want to pray. For those of you who want to make a difference at work, in your community, in this town. And you're scared or worried or concerned about the price that you're going to have to pay to make a difference. And just as Jeremiah bought the field in obedience and in hope, I'm going to pray for you guys that this week, that after this moment, we would step out in obedience to what God is calling us to do. That we would step out in obedience to do the things God has called us to do and to be carriers of hope. Like in the Gospel of Matthew, to be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. To be a lampstand that is not put under the bed. To be salt that has not lost its taste. We want to make a difference in our world. We want to share the hope of Christ. And so if that's you, and you want prayer for bravery, for courage, for obedience this morning, why don't you raise your hand after one, two, and three. Yeah, see those hands. Yeah, God, I just thank you for every person in this place that has responded to you. God, we know obedience can be really difficult, sometimes painful. God, sometimes it costs us a lot. 
But God, in this moment, right now, would you remind us of the cross? Jesus, you said, not my will be done, Lord, but yours. And Jesus, the same obedience that you showed, God, I pray, would you give to us? We know that your spirit lives in us. That we don't do things by might or by power, as Omega said, but by your spirit. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask you right now, would you teach us the obedience of Christ in this moment? That we would know, even though we might suffer, and even though it might cost, and even though it might be difficult and hurt and scary at times, that we can trust that, God, you will not put us to shame. That we can trust that, God, when we have a hope in you, it does not come to failure or fault. But God, you come true on all of your promises. That God, when you command us to step out, God, we know in faith that you will meet us as we step. And so God, I pray for, for, for my brothers and my sisters who are, who are looking to stand for you, to step out for you, to speak hope on your behalf. God, I pray right now that like Joshua, they would be bold and courageous. That as they step, they would know that the land that they tread, it belongs to you. God, the workplaces, the families, the schools, the situations, God, we know that all things are submitted to you. And God, we pray that, God, you would open our eyes, our ears, our minds to see, God, the work that you are doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.